sexual swear words. The video certificates are there to give you the chance to make an informed choice. They allow you to have peace of mind and be entertained. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the film. were putting the heat on the French Golden Delicious racket. Problems. So when the Crunch Bunch got word they were paying him a visit, Spats Fellini decided to turn over a new leaf. Now, watch out! What,
sexual swear words. The video certificates are there to give you the chance to make an informed choice. They allow you to have peace of mind and be entertained. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the film. were putting the heat on the French Golden Delicious racket. Problems. So when the Crunch Bunch got word they were paying him a visit, Spats Fellini decided to turn over a new leaf. Oh, no, okay, Why, Captain Walensky, have one on the house. You win this time, Spats. But I just know there's something going on behind my back. The Crunch Bunch. He will be surprised when he sees you. Eric! Look who's here. Yes? Trevor Brooking. Who? Trevor Brooking. How you going? I see you play Atari. Now and then, Mr. Bookham? Brooking. Oh. Do you fancy a game of Pelly Soccer? No, he's not interested in... I'll have a go. See? Oh, forty love. He's a bit good, you Mr. Putin. I've told you, it's Brooking. Brookie. Well, whatever his name is. Ever thought of playing for Luton Town Reserve, youngster? No. Atari. Simply more fun and games. And now, preview time. When it comes to entertainment, you can't beat a good film. So let's take a look at what's coming your way. house on the edge of the woods. Out here it's safe and peaceful. A family alone. Mom? Yes, sweetheart? Can you leave the door open a crack? A favorite uncle who needed their help. Things haven't been going so good for me since I got back, sis. Come stay with us. But when they invited him in... I think I better keep my eye on you. They let in something they could never imagine. Or ever escape. What's wrong with you? Bad Moon. It doesn't have to be Halloween to be this scary. They broke into the mall for the wildest all-night party of their lives. A dead meat. But you're never alone. In the chopping mall. What's that? Robot life. Shopping mall, where shopping costs you an arm and a leg. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Perfect Movie. Please welcome your host, Richard Sandwich. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> like you mean it. Yeah. <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome. Oh, welcome to Richard Stanley's Perfect Movie with me. Richard Stanley's Perfect Movie. What a show we've got for you. Oh, my word. Here we go. Time to flock this dead horse one more time and see if we can maintain the enthusiasm from you out there and from us in here. Anyone else going mental? Anyone else had that point of lockdown where they have basically just gone mad? Uh, I'm feeling, I feel fine, but I have, I have got to that talking out loud to myself talking to inanimate objects like they're my friend's state of, of the lockdown. I think people were there before me, but I'm now I'm now at the just jabbering at inanimate objects. All right, mate. All right. Oh, yeah, having a sort of weird Pete and Dud conversation with, with some books. But anyway, welcome. Welcome to the show. Uh, if you've been to Perfect Movie before, you'll know what to expect. If you've never been to Perfect Movie before, I'd explain what's going on. This is a show about films, about loving films, where uh, a comedian will come on and do some material about films. I will talk to another comedian about their love of cinema, their favourite scenes, a beginning, middle and an end, and then we will uh, recreate those scenes uh, live for you in front of your very eyes so that they get to be part of their very own perfect movie. And we've spoken before about what a perfect movie is and what constitutes a perfect movie. It's a film really that you could watch any time, no matter how many times you've seen it. It's essentially a film that if you finished, you could watch it again. Uh, it's a film that you love. Obviously, it, we, I asked some of you, so if you're out there in watching this on Facebook, uh, do comment with your favourite films. I'd love to know some of your favourite films. Uh, I will come to, you know, I'll ask you. If there's any questions you want to raise, raise them. We'd love to know anything we're doing. Any comments, keep posting comments, keep posting comments. I'd love to know what you're thinking of the show. Also, donate. Uh, you can see at the bottom, uh, I have a, a coffee, Ko-Fi, Ko-Fi page. Still don't know how to pronounce it. Only ever seen it written down. Uh, <laughs> the Ko-Fi, Ko-Fi.com, Richard Sandling, uh, where you can buy me a kebab because, you know, we need uh, we need kebabs to get us through this. I feel that's the that's the only way forward. Uh, other than that, it's been great. One of the other things I'd like to ask you in the Facebook thing, which is something I'm going to ask some of the uh, front row people in a moment, some of the acts, is I would like to know if you have an example of a time you saw a film that you thought was brilliant. Like you saw it, you're like, oh my God, that's one of the best films I've ever seen in my life. And then you went to school the next day or college or work and you said, I saw this brilliant film last night. It was, and everyone went, that film's shit. What are you talking about? <laughs> and you were heartbroken because you still don't understand, even to this day, why everyone, everyone seems to hate this film that you saw was lovely. Everyone's got a film, like there's millions of films that people like that you can't see the attraction to. But I'm talking about the film that you saw that you genuinely thought was mind-blowingly amazing. And then when you talk to everyone else, everyone at the time was like, that's terrible. And almost to this day, maybe that that that, that level of thinking still prevails. I'll tell you my one. My one is uh, Alien 3. Uh, I'm a massive fan of it. I think Alien 3 is genuinely a masterpiece. I will genuinely fight, genuinely fight anyone who says Alien 3 is shit. Uh, I love it. Sorry, I got it for, as we mentioned, you saw last week, RM videos down the road in Benfleet. Got, uh, got Alien 3 on video brought it home watched it like was amazing apart from anything uh bold correct choices i did like everyone things people would hate about it is things i like like i really 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 like the fact uh spoiler alert that they just kill off everyone at the beginning and it's like no one survived no one survives raiders except ripley brilliant like that's what i want like brilliant i like the fact that it's full of pretty much all my favorite british actors uh it's basically skinheads in space it was basically like a, it was like sort of watching an alan clark film uh like it was brilliant and then like but also just the sort of the the mood the tone everything about it i genuinely found the dialogue really funny i really like my favorite this thing's really pissed off by uh the great phil davis screaming this thing's really pissed off when he runs through there you got pete pofflesweight doing his uh you know what if we get lost what if it won't cooperate this was <laughs> which is just like a fantastic, so the whole thing is just like brilliant. And also it sort of moves, it's really moving ending. When you actually think that's how it ends, you think after all she's been through, she has to die to save herself. Spoiler alert, she doesn't die, it's a franchise. But Alien 3, and I remember watching it and I was genuinely like, this is one of the best films ever. And I went to school the next day and I was like, oh my God, have you seen Alien 3? And it was like, yeah, it's shit, there's no shooting like there is in Aliens, was basically everyone's uh, reaction to it. And it was at that point I was like, I genuinely am not like any of you. I mean, there were inklings that I was not like any of them at school. You know, there's that feeling of like, you know, not in a bad way, like not like, you know, 
you've got to worry about me. But, you know, you know, we all like football. We all like Red Wolf. You know, we have a sort of, you know, this, it's very convergent in our sort of uh, circles, you know, very sort of, you know, integrated. But this was the moment you go, ah, oh, like, you don't like Alien 3. I have nothing in common with any of you people. Uh, so, yeah, that was the thing. So Alien 3. Alien 3 is brilliant. I did a thing where I had to do my top 10 sci-fi films of all time for a thing, and I chose Alien 3. <laughs> people people still gave me like, why did you pick that on any of the other Alien films? Because Alien 3 is fucking brilliant. And if you don't know that, you need to re-watch it and sort your life out. Uh, so <laughs> I will be doing other TED Talks. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that's how I feel very strongly about Alien 3. Um, if anybody else... Uh, so I'm going to come to the people in the front row. Uh, uh, Don, do you have a, a, a film? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's probably... Uh, <coughs> National Treasure 2 or <laughs> <laughs> No, but no, no, no. My my friends like National Treasure. Your friends probably like that as well, didn't they? The the maniacs. <laughs> yeah. So Did you, have, uh, you have one that people didn't sort of uh didn't like you know that you saw or thought it was amazing mm -hmm. and people just don't like it. Right. Uh then one of the, my movie is based on nostalgia. My dad had a very small DVD collection. So this is one of the movies that I thought was amazing. I showed my friends and that's a uh, we talked about it in the green screen, uh, I think on the first show I was on, which is Trick or Treat uh, right. with Ozzy Osbourne and Gene Simmons. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. it is the perfect teen horror 80s movie. And all my friends were like, this, this is absolute garbage. <laughs> ah. Well, that is the good for me. I don't know if you've, has anyone seen, is everyone in, is everyone else in the front row? All the acts seen Trick or Treat? Trick or Treat? Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's a long time ago. I mean, I've got it on video. I don't think it's behind me, but I think just say is it behind me. No, I don't think it is. Yeah, it has, the one it has with great music, Oz everything. Ozzy Oz Oz plays Oz the um, preacher, like the sort of the televangelist yeah. preacher. Yeah. And they kill yeah, him yeah, by yeah. putting yeah. a hand across the screen and it like he dies. It's like a really good yeah. uh it's like he sort of he's like he's like a loser at high school who's just like he doesn't sell his soul to the devil, I think, does he? But he like hires he like sort of wish fulfills his rock and roll icon or someone to come like to be his hero but obviously yeah, it's, like, that's right. it's a yeah. terrible monster not not the actual person so yeah 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 it's a very good uh yeah that's i mean that's that's a fair one because that's not a great film but it doesn't deserve everyone to say it's shit do you know what i mean like that's one of those films where you well, kind of go i can your love for it right but it's unfair for everyone i don't i don't think it's I don't think you're misguided in your enthusiasm for it. I think it's a good film. Like you are right. So you correct, Don. Correct. <laughs> okay. I will allow but, that. <laughs> the problem is, is any '80s teen horror movie a good film? That, that's uh... well. I mean, I suppose. I mean, there's it depends depends on the criteria by which you're judging it, doesn't it? I suppose. You know? Phantasm. Phantasm. Is that? That's is that good. What, yeah, well, it is good. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many sequels to Phantasm are there now? There's like 700 sequels to Phantasm. Yeah. I Phantasm like... 2 is actually better, I think. Because mm. uh, it's it's that same thing where the, they got a... Because the first one was, had a tiny budget and then they, it was a hit. So they got to... Basically, similar to Evil Dead, they got to basically do it again with a, a larger budget on the yeah. second film. And so well, Phantasm yeah, I think it's... it's great when those sorts of films happen isn't it when you have that situation and but rather than make a sequel they basically remake the first one i do do like that as a, as a gambit uh, that's essentially what i do every week on this show i just remake <laughs> the one for it <laughs> just with more money <laughs> <laughs> hoping no one can tell the difference <laughs> <laughs> so phil do you have a uh do you have a film that you that you loved that everyone's that you then found out you were in the minority. I, I do, but first of all, I have to say that you're bang right with Alien 3. Yes! Absolutely. Unappreciated masterpiece. Ah, and everyone talks about, like, oh, there's this version was better, this version. You watch it and you go, it's not better. Like, it's not better. Like, there's lots of other stuff in yeah. it. And I mean, people also, oh, the original script was amazing. That probably, I'm not saying that it wouldn't have been amazing if they'd have made that original one with the people in the wooden huts, you know, <laughs> you know the people in the wooden huts doing a sort of Donkey Kong on the, like, the, the slats. <laughs> Would have been good, but we got the film we've got, and it's brilliant, so, like, stop your whining. Did you hear the story about why the creature looked different? No, oh, no, maybe it didn't, maybe not. <laughs> the guy that designed it didn't follow the, the original Giga stuff. 
and then they 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 got they got towards the end and they thought well we've we've got it now and so that is why it um it births from the dog so there, there's the line in the film that says oh that's why it's different yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, i love that stuff is that also like because you know, i think in the original i think one of the things in the original thing was it was when they supposed to be like farmers it was supposed to kind of a cow or something or something <laughs> more an exciting animal but that's good you know i, I just like also i like the idea they've got to try and kill it without any weapons it's like <laughs> you know and also it's got that great you know you know this is we're all control now the facts got the great like you know and then oh, just can i ask can i ask <laughs> yeah Question about Alien 3. Yes. Uh, technically, Ripley also doesn't survive aliens because they make her from it blood, don't they? They re reconstruct her. Is that right? That's the fourth one. Ah, sorry. Sorry. The fourth one. They, they, fourth one God, geez, like, you know, like me is halfway, Eli, for God's sake. <laughs> All right. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. You'll have your term later. Have a think about have a think okay. about the contribution for later on, Eli, and see whether it, you know, maybe. Right. <laughs> stum, stum, stum. <laughs> but so Phil, do you so do you have a film that you loved that uh people I do. let's have it? Um, it's it's Star Wars Attack of the Clones. Star Wars Attack of the Clones. <laughs> I Genuinely thought, loved it, did you? I do. It's um, uh, I'm, I'm fully on board with uh, Phantom Menace being diabolical, but um, there's something about Attack of the Clones that I, I, I love. In particular, the scene when C-3PO's head is on a drone's body and a dr drone's head's on C-3PO's body. It just it cracks me up every time. I love it. Now, what's the big fight scene in Attack of the Clones? Because basically, yeah. the, the prequels are basically Ugh, then there's a big, then there's a big, there's a big memorable fight at the end. Yeah, yeah. Which what's the big memorable fight in Attack of the Clones? Is that the is that's on Geonosis when um, Anakin and Padme and um, Skywalker Kenobi are tied to poles, and the the big mantis creature comes out to try and ah. kill them, and then the the drones and the Jedi appear. And Yoda goes something like, "Around the survivors of perimeter form." Ah, yeah, I don't remember that fight. <laughs> 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 <It's, laughs> I mean, I, yeah, is that the one? Is that the one? Because I, I genuinely, I remember Phantom Menace, and then the next two are basically the same film that I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> I just don't. I've, I've watched them. I just they just don't they don't go in. I don't know mm. what it is. Like I don't, I don't even hate them. I just don't remember them. Like I, what was the one where he seems to have this weird sort of wet dream about his mum, and then he goes and murders some like that's, that's Attack of the Clones. He's having this weird like oh, 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 remembering his mum, and he wakes up and he's all. He's all <laughs> I'm sure it's probably it's supposed to be a flashback, but it's very, definitely, definitely a wet dream about his dead mum, and then in order, to, uh, in order to overcome that that issue, he then murders a load of indigenous people. So, uh, I mean, well, that was my take on it because that's definitely how it was made. <laughs> Maybe I'm misreading that, but I don't know because I remember at the time like what's what's going on. I remember they just put in the jewel of fate. I think he's on one of those like bike things. I think he's on you know the the. Mm. And it, they just put in Jewel of Fates because they were like, we need to put in something exciting. <laughs> so they just uh, have in a playing Jewel of Fates play because he's got his bike, like. But yeah. Well, good for I'm going to say good for you. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's, there's no right or wrong answers. There's no right or wrong answers. But I feel trick or treat is a more right answer than. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you off because you get a pass because you, be you believed in Alien 3. So, you know. Every time you clap your wings and every time you clap your hands, another person believes in Alien Three. <laughs> that's the uh, that's the thing. So excellent, excellent. Have you had anyone? Have any any comments or anything on Facebook, Holly? Anything to report? Anyone got a, a yeah. film there? Don Hill says Pokemon Three. Pokemon Alice Gibson 3. says Inception. Inception is a film that he, that he oh. liked. That everyone else hated. Yeah. Or is that your favourite film? Well, I guess so. Alice Gibson just says Inception, so I, I guess that was uh, maybe it's maybe, that's, maybe film, it's a trick, know. and maybe we've got to try to work out. Like maybe we have to go, maybe we have to like reprogram him from thinking that. <laughs> I, like I don't challenge. know anything about films, so I couldn't tell if that was something that people are likely to like or not. 
Um, well, I mean, everyone seems to like. I would say Inception one of those films that everybody liked, but a lot of people go, "It's not as good as you think it is, mate." But obviously, <laughs> if you like Inception, then uh, it is. It is good. It's one of those weird films where I sort of it's very impressive, and there's some there's some lovely because I'm a big fan of like uh, internal logic type stuff. Like there's a bit I think at the beginning when he's firing and he keeps catching these shells that come out so they don't make a noise, doesn't leave any evidence. The things like that, I'm like that's amazing. Like I like I like little bit I like little touches like that when I watch it. So this whole like you can go inside people's brain. That's kind of that that's like that's kind of I just accept that because that's sci-fi. I like the like the, the minutiae of detail. So there's lots of nice stuff in there. But there's bits where they go, we can just think of anything we like and they go, yeah. And it's like well then why don't we just get like all Tom Hayes is like get a slightly bigger gun. At no point does anyone go, we can just do anything we like. Yeah. Because <laughs> also like, really, but then once they realise that it's all happened and they're like, all bets are off, everyone knows they're being incepted, we've got to get out of here. At no point does anyone say, release the Kraken! <laughs> my, first, my first thing, well, we haven't got to pretend this is real anymore, we can do anything we like, they're brilliant, then let's have a thousand Donkey Kongs coming to punch everyone in the face and <laughs> Godzilla and Predator turn up. You know what I mean? It's like, and also the whole thing was because he wanted to like he had to do this mission so that he could go. He would be allowed into Europe to see his kid. Uh, but at no point did anyone say to Michael Caine, "Why not just bring your bring the kid out of Europe to me in America? Then I can see my kid in America." Nobody said like doing all this thing to go and so he can like be allowed into Europe to see his kid. No one said the kid's not allowed to leave Europe. <laughs> so that was my thought. I was like, "Why don't we? You know, <laughs> it's one of those things that like like when you watch Shallow Grave, just keep the money." And call the police. <laughs> you literally, literally turn the You have no idea who Keith Allen is. You don't. You genuinely can answer. You can answer honestly every question they've got, except did he have anything with him? Just say no. There you go. Don't need to, don't need to chop his body up and get all like uh, go mad. You can just. He turned up yesterday. You don't know who he is. Just call the police and hide the money. Literally that simple. What is wrong with you people? So <laughs> also, I just want to say, uh, David Morgan says, I remember Mortal, Com Mortal Kombat 2 being absolute nonsense. And Richard Peck says, that's what I love about it, Dave. <laughs> well, I mean, yes, yes. Mortal Kombat 2. I don't know. I mean, if you haven't seen Mortal Kombat 1, will Mortal Kombat 2 make sense? That's the question. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you don't even want to follow it. <laughs> Here comes Dante. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's good. It's like watching the thing I like about Mortal Kombat movies most is kind of going, oh, is this a young martial artist who suddenly in the in the next fifteen years became really famous? Is this an old martial artist who's doing pretty much two of his last films before he stops making movies anymore? Or is this just a stunt man who's never going to do anything other than stunts and not going to be an actor anymore? That's the game. It's like, is this, is this someone on the way up? Is this someone on the way down? Is this just a stunt person who's doing some on-screen stuff because it's mostly a fight film? So it's, that's my favourite thing about the Mortal Kombat. Not my favourite thing about the Mortal Kombat movies, but that is my favourite thing about the Mortal Kombat movies. <laughs> oh! Think we've uh, so I feel that was a I feel that was a good bit of catharsis. I feel that was a good bit of catharsis to like share our our solo passions and find ourselves like justified from everyone else. I'm very happy about this. Uh, so one of the things I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to get an act on. If you're ready for an act, is everyone ready for an oh, act? Oh yeah, yeah, good because you Let's get do one. It. <laughs> so as you know, what I like to do is I like to shout out film quotes before I bring the act on. Uh, so because of uh, everyone, uh, everyone's love of Alien 3, uh, after 3, <laughs> I want you all to shout out really loudly, this thing's really pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> like you've just run down a corridor, shut a thing behind you, and the aliens try to get to be can't. So this thing's really pissed off, like like your proper, proper cockney skinhead prisoner. After 3, everyone. Ready? One, two, three. Really 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 oh, that's the politest prison. <laughs> that was like that was like the Andram version of Alien Three. It's like this thing is really pissed off. <laughs> so this thing's really pissed off. That's what it. That's good. We've done it. We've done it. So uh, everybody, uh, start applauding. Woo Cheering and welcome, Mr. Matt Box. Hey. Hey. Where's the cat? Very kind. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I feel like I need to be very angry now to back up being this thing's really pissed off. <laughs> thing being me. Uh, hello, I'm Matt Box. That's my real name. 
Uh, I mean, we're not like I'm sure there's some filmy people watching. When I meet kind of filmmakers, particularly camera people, they get quite excited by that name because Matbox is also a piece of filming equipment. So it's a bit of, <laughs> I don't know if you've seen on the end of lenses, you've got these flaps in there to reduce lens flare. Uh, and the only difference between that Matbox and this Matbox is ain't nothing stopping this flare. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you might have noticed I'm, I'm a ginger man. Uh, you know, true facts, non-fiction, based on real events. Uh, but it's a bit, a bit weird growing up. It's a good insight. Uh, it's growing up ginger. You get bullied for the colour of pubes. You haven't grown yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as if puberty isn't hard enough that you've got like, doink, doink. Oh, no, that insult's about to get frighteningly more accurate, isn't it? <laughs> um, so there's like a fair bit of teasing that goes with that. And I think uh, one of the... Uh, elements of that is depictions in films. So that's something I'm going to talk about a bit now. Uh, and so like, I'm not arguing for kind of our own award at the Academy. You know, I don't think there needs to be a best supporting ginge, the only award that would be made from copper. Uh, that's not what I'm arguing, arguing for. And I know that representation in cinema is a much bigger, more universal, you know, spanning through lots of time, you know, as big as the loopholes in Looper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's just like if you take like one of the bigger issues, maybe it's like a depiction of black people in cinema uh, and just like how much the black community really supported Black Panther to have like a real black hero you know, starring in a Marvel superhero film and how amazing that was after decades of like uh, white actors in blackface after, uh, you know, the black guy being the first one to die in a film. Uh, and like imagine like... Uh, in kind of the most Marvel films, if like the main white guy was the first to die, then those films would be a lot shorter and some would argue <laughs> a lot more enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and obviously the, that kind of representation has like a, a, a wider effect in society. So uh, black people being depicted as kind of gangsters, drug dealers, uh, kind of generally criminals, uh, has a knock on effect. So uh, as I'm sure you've seen stats recently, black people are eight times more likely to be stopped and searched. And uh, you can't actually get the stats for this, but I would imagine uh, gingers out of all the white people would be the least likely to get stopped and searched. No one thinks we can do anything cool. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I think a ginger would only get stopped and searched if there was reports that someone in the vicinity had been practicing close-up magic. <laughs> uh, and so like, I've, I looked into this, and this is a, a trope of cinema. It's, it's called uh, Redheads Are Uncool. And this is from tvtropes.org, so, you know, reputable source with a, a .org. Uh, the high tendency of fiction for young nerds, geeks, and other social outcasts to have red hair. Um, and uh, so obviously the first example I'm going to use for this is, I don't know if you guys know 1999's American Pie. Uh, the guy called Chris Owen played a character called The Shermanator. <laughs> it was one of his key lines. I'm a sophisticated sex robot sent back through time. Uh, and he was obviously the archetypal nerd. And he was used as a real rock bottom point for the protagonists in America by all trying to lose their virginity that a ginger had managed to do it before them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, in, in the end, actually, like, spoiler alert, but it turns out uh, that he didn't actually... Uh, get laid, but uh, in, instead is kind of called out publicly and then wets himself. Uh, and the only kind of uh, uh, kind of good thing that comes out of this is in the second film, he finally kind of loses his virginity to a mega babe in Shannon and Elizabeth, um, which is like some weird little thing that uh, happens in cinema where a redhead is kind of bullied, and then later on it's kind of justified by kind of getting the girl at the end, like some kind of incel inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, now, I understand you guys are probably watching this thinking, you're trying to argue that gingers, this trope of gingers being uncool uh, is kind of bad, or doing it on a Saturday night on a live stream, talking <laughs> about the details of film. Uh, and, you know, that's probably the same as kind of maybe arguing uh, that the removal of racist statues, saying uh, it doesn't respect history, they're not racist, and it was done too violently, by getting pissed, starting fights with the police and demonstrating frequent bouts of racism. <laughs> um, <laughs> trust me, the irony, unlike for those morons, is not lost on me. Um, but the kind of the main reason I kind of think 
uh, this is a kind of real issue in cinema, is for the Harry Potter films. So the depiction of Ron Weasley. So in the books, he's seen as uh, kind of quite heroic and quite like a, a good kind of uh, partner for Harry. But in the films, he's made uh, to me much more of a moron. And so like an example of this is there's an area in the book where they're being chased by uh, spiders in a forest. Uh, and in the, in the book, the uh, car is kind of drives itself away and they get away safely. In the films, they change that to this, this fantastic line where Ron just stops in the forest for no reason, going, I'm glad we're out of there, mm -hmm. which is like a typical kind of moral line they give to Ron Weasley before he's then shortly attacked by spiders. <laughs> <laughs> the example of just making him more of an idiot and more uncool just for the, to make Harry look better in comparison. Uh, and so the real... Real reason when I started thinking about it, why I hated the depiction of Ron Weasley in the Harry Potter films, was because when I was at school and they'd cast the three main characters, they went around all the local schools uh, looking for the lighting double and the body doubles. And all my friends were saying to me, oh, Matt, you should go for Ron. Oh, Matt, why don't you look like Ron? You should go for Ron. And I was like, hey, guys, I'm trying not to, like, uh, make gingers uncool on television and films. So, like, maybe I'm just not going to go for that. Uh, Fast forward a couple of years, and I actually know a guy called Ben, who ended up being Daniel Radcliffe's lighting double in the Harry Potter films. He travelled around the world doing it, made loads of money, loads of fun doing it. He's in the final scene of the last Harry Potter film, waving away some pretend children uh, off to Hogwarts. And he had a fantastic life, and I think, that should have been me! <laughs> <laughs> could have had that, I could have gone all around the world, I could have had an amazing life, I could have been in the final scene of Harry Potter, I could have released my own book, uh, <laughs> the one that you can't hide, our lighting double that's always in someone else's shadow, that could have been my lifestyle. But the main reason that I hate depictions of gingers in films is because they're mainly not me. <laughs> <laughs> I've got guys, thank you very much. Yay! <laughs> Everybody, hey. <laughs> excellent work, excellent work. That's fantastic. Uh, oh my word. What so Matt, Matt, where 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 can the people find you online? Uh, on Twitter, it's Matt Box, but with three X's, so M A T T B O Triple X, uh, or on Instagram, M A T T B Zero X. So just mm. just confusing different spellings for different platforms. Yeah, I'm very much excellent. We're going to check out that stuff. I'm also a very, I mean, I have like other things. I'm, honestly, I'm always like, you know, underscores and all sorts, because when I sign up for things, I'm like, this won't last and I don't really care. And then 10 years later, I'm trying <laughs> to explain to people how they can find me online and no one can because it was something I made up when I was like 17. So I'm stuck with it. I always relate really to the platform as well. So some bit of photography equipment's already got there before me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that must be that must be devastating to realise that uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> some equipment has got there before you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that was excellent. So, Holly, do we have any 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 comments or word from uh Facebook to mention? Um no, um, the Smith out more to come back. <laughs> they, they, they put long messages on here sometimes. Uh, Ed Boff says Mortal Kombat is still one of the better video game adaptions, mainly because it had a good structure to the plot, i.e., it could basically rip off Enter the Dragon just with more fantasy. Yeah, yeah, oh. good, good, good. I mean, that is that that is that is accurate. <laughs> And Darren Nuttall says, sorry I'm late, sir. I was watching No Sex, Please. We're British. Oh. Um, yeah. I, I, that, I'm guessing probably on... Uh, would that be... I think that's... Is that, was that live live on Talking Pictures TV that we keep mentioning? Talking Pictures TV, the best TV channel on TV at the moment? Don't know. Uh, oh, and there's we've actually, I'm, the, I'm, I'm uh... saying this too, Darren. So, uh, no. And they're showing love for Matt's book title as well. They liked that. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yes, 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 yes. Excellent, excellent. So moving on. So it's that time of the night where we get to play a game. And so what we're going to do this time is Don and Phil, you're going to combine forces to see if you can win. If we can, like, hands across the ocean, hands across the ocean, see if between you, you can beat the Play Your Video Cards Right Challenge. Now, if you've not seen Perfect Movie before, what we have is a game. 
uh, like higher or lower or play your cards right where you have to where that would be the game where you decide if a playing card that's turned over is higher or lower than the card that come before it what i have here is a selection of films from my vhs collection and you have to work out whether they're rated higher or lower on imdb than the film that was before it so it's oh i haven't done the sharing video thing yet that's 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 not going to work at all is it that's good 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 skills rich good skills <laughs> Good skills, good skills. Let's just get that up and ready. It's all right. It's not in any fold with any weirdness in it. It's just like not going to... Slick, slick as, slick as. Seamless. Yes. Yeah, see, see um, this is a well-oiled, this is a well-oiled machine. Um, <laughs> it's just not exactly what we hoped for. No, so I'm going to, sorry. So now you all get to watch me just faff about doing stuff, which is exactly well, what I Well, I can talk to you about what's on Facebook while you're doing that. So, yeah, tell me about um, some stuff on Facebook. Alice and then Gibson with... says that actually Inception was a favourite film. They didn't put that forward as a, a film Good. that other people hated. They are correct. <laughs> the soundtrack, um, also, the soundtrack for Inception is amazing. Like, it's genuinely amazing, the soundtrack. Yeah, someone uh, else it, is uh, people agreeing people with Pope Mon 3. One of the best things ever, so, hey, sorry. I was getting carried away. <laughs> uh, hang on. I'm stopping the screen share. I'm going to do it again. Keep going. Oh, oh okay. Um, uh, Prestige was better than Inception, says Phil Clements. Yeah. Uh, possibly, but it has that... Re but unfortunately, uh, I had just had a massive... I just got really irritated with the Prestige. Like, Prestige probably is better. But it was that thing that Chris Nolan does in all his films where he just spends every character go, do you know what I think? Do you know what I think? Do you know what I it's like in the Batman. You know what I you know what I'd like, Master Brace? I'd like to explain to you right now how the film's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same thing with the whole thing is they say this, they say this, they go in there, they go, oh, so the whole thing is so basically the whole thing. It, it's a trick. You don't know what's happening, and when you get to the end, it's not what you think it is. All right, so when we get to the end, it's not what they think it is. And we get to the end, and it's not what they think it is. Everyone goes, oh, my God, I never saw that coming. Like, literally every third <laughs> second someone said, at the end, it won't be what you think it is. And you all thought it was what you all didn't know that was what was happening. It's like madness. It's like it's like a chess. You know, when you watch these shows, people do chess. And they play the chess game, and they're like, any game of chess? Oh, it's because I beat you uh, because I think three moves ahead. You tried to beat me, but you won't beat me because I always think two moves ahead. And then at the end, he wins. He goes, that's because I thought. Three moves ahead. So any time you see a baddie playing chess, I'm just going to pop off right now because it's basically going to be a chess thing at the end and it's just going to be infuriating. So the prestige was good, but it had that annoying Christopher Nolan thing of just sort of being a bit rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> In the way that he can't help him. He can't trust his audience to be as good mm. as he thinks they have to be for the film he thinks he's making. Uh, <laughs> it's my opinion. You like, just can't trust them to go with it and trust that they'll actually get it if he doesn't spell it out for them, which I think is disingenuous. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to see if I can share this and we're going to play our game. Are you ready, team? Are you Let's ready? Yes. Okay, so here we go. Oh, it's coming. Can you see that? Yep, we can. Play your video cards right. Is everybody exciting? So I want to know what you think at home on Facebook. Let me know. Spread the word. Have a go. I'm going to crack open a beer. <laughs> while I'm doing it. Ah, it's that time of the evening. So the first film we have. 2019. <laughs> All right. Future is last year. <laughs> so also known as Warriors of the Wasteland, written and directed by the guy who also made Kill Them All and Come Back Home. 1990 Bronx Warriors, The Last Shark and Light Blast and co-written by the guy who has written 100 screenplays, including Tentacles, The Devil with Seven Faces, Thor the Conqueror, and Night of the Sharks. <laughs> it stars Fred Williamson and a few other genre favourites. Now, as we all know, you haven't got to guess this one. This is this is where we start. So, but as a rough guess, what do you think this is worth on IMDb? What do you think the rating of this on IMDb will be? Uh, 3.7. I'm going to say 4.5. 4.5. Let's see where we are. Let's see where we are. 4.6! Oh, you good, Tom. 4.6. Now, what's the next one we have here is A Breed Apart. Ruger Hauer, Powers Booth, Kathleen Turner, and Donald Pleasance in A Breed Apart. Uh, directed by Philip Mora. I don't know how you pronounce that. It's written down. Who did Communion in Mad Dog Murphy. And written by the guy who, did, who wrote four episodes of The Darling Buds of May, four episodes of Minder, and two episodes of Boone. 
Uh, <laughs> so we're in safe hands. Uh, it stars Rutger Howe as a Vietnam veteran isolationist environmentalist who lives on a secluded island up against egg poachers, specifically Powers Booth, a mountain climber that Donald Pleasance has hired to steal bald eagle eggs. Uh, Kathleen Turner is a love interest, and as it's an 80s action movie, Brian James is in it as a baddie. Uh, in fact about the film once principal filming in North Carolina was finished the film reels were sent back by plane to Los Angeles one of the reels out of the fog never arrived so the movie was substantially reorganised around the missing scenes shot out of order in editing and this explains why some subplots some subplots are incomplete and some characters have entirely no backstory <laughs> so do you think <laughs> read apart <laughs> is rated higher or lower than 4.6 what do we think Man, that's a hard one. I'm going to say higher just for Donald being in it. See, I, I'd say higher just for Rutger. I'm a big yeah. Rutger fan. Yeah. Okay, I'll go so with higher because my Facebook gang are saying higher. Okay, okay, good, good, good. It is higher. 5.5. Oh, excellent, yes. excellent. Wow. Doing well to you. Just a reminder, you win nothing. <laughs> the club. Hellishly good special effects, because that's the most important thing when you're trying to find any press quote to promote your movie. <laughs> <laughs> special effects are good. <laughs> From nobody. It's just, just something someone's written in inverted commas. There is no, 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 no one attributed to it. Uh, the club. Membership will cost you your soul. Uh, it's directed by a cinematographer <laughs> who mainly does TV shows in Canada and is written by the guy who also wrote Mo just a ton of Stargate uh, TV shows and it stars uh, Kim Coates and Andrea Roth uh, Time stops at midnight the senior prom of five students one murderous counsellor and John they must find their courage to face themselves or when time starts again they may find that they are joining John's club all you have to do is commit murder or suicide uh, Corey Hayne was originally cast but fired after two days do you, do you think this at the mercy of the darkest fears, do you think this? It's and Kim Coates, so that's even better. I don't know if I'm passing that right. I've only ever seen it written down. Uh, do you think the club is higher or lower than 5.5? It has to be lower. This it's got to be lower, higher. surely. <laughs> what do you think, lower? Consensus on Facebook yeah. is lower. It is lower! Yes! One more for the quick, one more for the clean sweep. <laughs> the Queen seeps. <laughs> That's a different. <laughs> it is a birthday. Maybe she's had too much. Who knows? <laughs> last film. Last film we have is Space Invaders. Uh, written and directed by the guy who did Angus, Baby's Day Out, and The Genesis Code, and co-written by the guy who did nothing else other than write this and do art direction on it. Uh, it stars the sort of people you sort of go. Oh, I think I know him uh, from a thing, but most notably, it stars uh, Ariana Richards of Jurassic Park and Tremors fame, who receives an introducing credit despite it being her fifth film. Uh, the plot of this movie is that a sorcerer of an Asian invasion force has engine trouble. It lands on Earth, and it happens to be on Halloween, and everyone thinks that because they're four feet tall, it's Halloween. They're just children in costume, and so don't take them seriously. Uh, as the aliens wander around the countryside, they're taken to be children, and they make friends with two other children, one of whom is the daughter of the sheriff. Uh, most of the special effects shots were done in camera, which is why it took ages. And uh, it also stars uh, the guy from Killer Clowns from Outer Space playing the same character as the old man with his dog. Uh, and the actors were <laughs> when they were filming, so they basically just kept bumping into things the entire time. They had to be physically moved around the sex they couldn't see. Now, do you think a crazy rated U Space Invaders movie is higher or lower than The Club? I'm going to say higher, but just barely. Maybe about like a few decimals. We think higher? Are we going for yeah. higher? Higher. We're going for higher. It is higher! <laughs> Oh, that is way too high for that movie. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm gonna say right now that is nostalgia talking. That is not, <laughs> but it is definitely better than the club. But that is not, uh, <laughs> that is not accurate. <laughs> Especially from a writer well that's written nothing but that. Well played, well played, and was excellent work. And I remember you win nothing. Well, well played, Facebook as well. You did incredible work. I mean, I mean, yeah, it was good. It was good. Uh, all of those films are worth your time if you can find them i don't know uh 2019 is is you know although i i am finding my uh, my enthusiasm for uh i am finding my enthusiasm for uh, post-apocalyptic disaster movies a little bit less 
Uh, you know, I'm not as into them as I was before when they're more like documentaries. I much preferred it when they were whimsical, whimsical possibilities rather than uh, election campaigns and uh, and just oh. looking. You know, <laughs> like, you know, Children of Men's a brilliant film. You know, as a hypothetical future, brilliant. Very much enjoyed it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So moving on, moving on, team, moving on. We've done very well. So that's it. Are you ready for your uh, act, your last act of the show? Are you ready, team? Are you ready to bring out an, an act? I mean, say bring out. Yeah. Oh, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's isolating. Uh, we need a film quote we can shout to bring him out. Do we have any, uh, do we have any, uh, any quotes anyone would like to shout out? Any uh, get away from her, you bitch. Get away from her, you bitch. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, I love it so much. Love it so much. Oh, we could just do another one from Alien Three. No, we get, get away from it, you bitch. <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, so after three, really loudly, get away from it, you bitch. Like, like you want it to get away from her. <laughs> All right, that's your motivation, guys. <laughs> after three, ready? One, two, three. Get, get away, away from it, you bitch. bitch! Implore, in, you know, implausible, impeccable, <laughs> impossible, <laughs> all of it, amazing. So everybody, start uh, applauding, Woo-hoo. and whooping. Woo-hoo. <laughs> to Eli Silverman. Eli, hello, how are you doing, Eli? Hello. All right. How are you? <laughs> Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm. Uh, thank you very much. I'm. Uh, yeah. I'm going completely crazy here, uh, as well, normal. Well, you're a social, you're a social animal, aren't you, Eli? You need, you know. Yeah. Yeah. If you want, because I know you, you, you're like you're part. You know, you, you are. You know, you're a comedian, an actor. You know, a performer. You're also a DJ. You do a lot of DJing. Okay. So perhaps what we could do to make you feel like at home is perhaps every sort of five minutes, if someone could interrupt us and just ask you if he's got rumours by Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> <laughs> Fleetwood Mac, the bane of my life. Overrated. <laughs> Talk about the wrong show. Wrong show. Uh, ACDC. Richard, you meant... Uh, I've got... Several, oh God, I can't believe you're asking me that. <laughs> um, you said about choosing embarrassing things uh, when you sign up in the early days to um, to the internet. A friend of mine has the second name Hampton, and he was getting his first email account when the Phantom Menace was coming out. So his email address to this day is the Hampton Menace. <laughs> uh, and yeah, he has to do that, give people that like on LinkedIn as his. Uh, email address and he's trying to get a job. <laughs> I mean, it's like, that's that thing where you go, I just, it's just so glad that I don't have to apply for real jobs anymore. You go, what's your email address? You're like, ah. Oh. Well, I also, I'm at an age now, I'm at the age where I still say, uh, I still have to say, <clears throat> all one word. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm not young. Like, I have to, it wasn't a given. It was never a given. It's just a force of habit now. All one word, lowercase. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so mr eli would you like you know your your uh how's your uh noodle collection going is he gone i can't hear him oh no yeah he's frozen and uh... he's frozen oh no i no. will never know the best ramen noodles he's like wrapped <laughs> <laughs> him in carbonite there he is Stop really that, that sounded go. just like a, a jungle tune with uh, the time stretching on your voice there to me, uh, Richard. Right, so, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, sorry, I think you froze. I apologise. So how's your... Because uh, I, I my, my thing, my, my passion is VHS tapes. Your passion is noodles. Am I right? Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, vinyl noodles. Uh, getting into sauce sachets now, to my chagrin. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, also, small bits of plastic. Um, I like erasers, novelty erasers as well. Uh, so a lot of stuff, 
a lot of stuff, but not VHS tapes. <laughs> uh, I've got that, one VHS crazy. here, actually. I've got one VHS here. I don't know if you're interested in this. I can get this to you. Uh, Ooh, it's uh, Wall Master. Wow. It's yeah. It's a, it's an instructional video for laying laying wood bits down. <laughs> uh, I mean, I will have it. <laughs> <laughs> I do have, I do have, uh, I do have uh, Roy Sutton's uh, routing guide, so you know. Like, oh my word! Yeah. I mean, well, well, if you're into that genre, I'm sure this is a total classic, mate. <laughs> I mean, it's, some would, some would say definitive. Of... You know, there's just like certain <laughs> things come along that are like genre-defining moments. Where you're like, there's yes. like, there's like the French Connection. There's like Rolling. There's like the Matrix. Well, that is essentially for sort of DIY flooring. That is like, that's like the French Connection. You know what I mean? That's like <laughs> much sought after. You know what I mean? Like, it's incredible. Yeah, it's yours, mate. Thank it's you. Yours. This is the, this is the best day ever. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mr. Eli, I suppose with all your all your enthusiasms for all the minimum, you know, bits of plastic and rubbers and stuff, do you have much chance? Do you, do you watch many films? Uh, yeah, I do like do like films. Um, I've been watching quite a few. Um, someone's lent me their uh, Disney Plus subscription, nice. Uh, so I've been uh, been catching up on all the Marvel ones because I wasn't I like them, but not really enough to. St- Sort of go shell out when they come out in the cinema, you know. I can I can wait. I still want to watch them, but I can wait two years. You know, I don't give a shit. Uh, but so I've been catching up on those, um, and I've been uh, watching a lot of uh, arty French noirs on uh, on movie. Yeah, do you like yeah. an arty French noir. Yeah. After dinner noir. And <laughs> uh, so yeah, I I, I love movies. Love movies, me. <laughs> do you remember as a? Do you ever? Did you have a particular favourite as a younger man that you loved a lot? Did you sort of? Whereas when you were younger, did you go, "Oh, I, that, that was a film that you were really fond of as a sort of teen or a child"? Basically, Jaws. Yeah, Jaws and uh, Rose of the Lost Ark. Um, mm. And uh, and Back to the Future. I know, boring, but that's it. That's my generation. Yeah, no, my first sort of cinema yeah. going experience. My, my my sort of distinct early cinema going experiences. There's two distinct scenes where I that sort of were transporting and transformative. That's the opening sequence in Raiders of the Lost Ark, and uh, the uh, "I am your father" scene, uh-huh. or you know whatever the fuck he says. "I am your father" scene in uh, in uh, Empire Strikes Back. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, a it's all very mainstream generation X here, sorry. I saw, I mean, I don't remember seeing Empire Strikes Back in the cinema, but I would have done because I was a child and it was a film that came out, so I would have gone to see it. And I mm. genuinely don't remember having a long lasting, I don't remember having a long standing memory of that scene blowing my mind. Like, I don't remember seeing it in the cinema and going, <gasps> and leaving like mind blown that that's what would happen so i don't i mean i must have done but i don't you know it's one of these things i know it's a big deal but i don't remember that being a big i don't even remember seeing the film in the cinema so like it's a shame i don't have that from a you know i don't have that as a a moment to sort of latch on yeah. to I but it is a great moment because yeah. of the particular age i was i was i think that was the first star wars film that i had actually seen i think i saw i saw i saw episode one or whatever or what was it, episode eight? Oh, fucking... Su- this is... <laughs> stupid. Whatever, the first one. I think I saw the first one. There's three Star Wars films and then there's some other ones. So when you talk about Star yeah. Wars, like, you mean you mean, you mean mean the three the, the three Star Wars films? Exactly. Oh, yeah. T- Attack of the Clones. I, I, I cannot back that up. That, <laughs> film, that is a film. I could not... I just could not stay awake. I've tried to watch it about three times. <laughs> it it resists wakefulness. Like it's like <laughs> cinematic smack. That thing. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all right. <laughs> it's not. I mean, it's just weird because normally, if you see Eli, he's with uh, 
with Paul Gannon, aren't you? Off <laughs> Paul Gannon, and it can you can can turn. A, sometimes you do sort of antagonise each other a little bit during your uh, podcast recordings. Slightly. So Slightly. I'm trying to work. I'm going to try and give. I'm going to try and keep this light so that you have the opportunity to 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 shine, Elo, without antagonism. Without antagonism. Let's okay. see how Is that right? whether, you need, whether you need the cruelty to function or whether you can <laughs> function as a as a decent human being without it. <laughs> I don't know. It sounds like a tall order, but yeah. <laughs> so can you remember as a younger man? Right. <laughs> I mean, this is the perfect time to do the mise en scene for the scene, isn't it? <laughs> Just getting it ready. <laughs> Yeah. This will make sense. I mean, not the dinosaur. We're not no. doing Jurassic Park. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> ah, disastrous. Do you remember the first time you watched a film that made you, like, sort of blew your mind? Like, as a teenager, as a young man, as a young adult, that made you sort of take films a bit more seriously, that the first one that sort of properly, like, resonated with you? Um, I've, I think Back to the Future because I, I was in America. I've got family there, I was in America. And I think that was back in the time when films in America were released a year before or something, you know, like ridiculous, like, um, and uh, that affected me hugely. And I remember, yeah, thinking that was brilliantly constructed. Uh, also the Godfather uh, uh, films, the one and two were made into a mini series for TV, uh, and it was recut by Coppola himself. But he actually put bits of he, he he messed up with the order. So there's bits of Godfather Two next to bits that are actually Godfather One, and vice versa. You know, and he's made it chronological, and that uh, that just got me well into it. Uh, the, God, the Godfather Saga, it's called, or something. It's like a forerunner to what they did with the Sopranos. Nice. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to do, well, so we, oh yeah, we're going to do your favourite opening, ending and middle uh, to any to, in miscellaneous scenes. Now, obviously, uh, there are many choices. So do you would like to talk about some of the, maybe some of the beginnings you thought of doing that we didn't, we didn't get around to doing that you would like to have done that you, you know, that aren't the ones we've chosen? Yeah, well, I wanted to do Psycho, but then at the beginning was, wasn't the actual beginning. I wasn't aware of the stringentness uh, of, uh, <laughs> of the rules to the show. Yeah, really just, opening, um, opening means opening, not uh, not within the first half hour. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, but yeah, so I wanted to do Psycho. Um, I run a, I mean, I try. I mean, I run a loose ship, but I, you know, there's <laughs> just uh, there's just a certain amount of laissez-faire I will not tolerate. <laughs> <laughs> I like um I always always like it in a film when they tell a little mini story like what where they do with Bond uh before the yeah. uh, before the credits, you know. I think that's a great yeah, thing yeah. to do. Uh a little prologue, I like a little prologue. Mr. Klein, uh with uh, Alan Delon, uh, uh which is really depressing and dark. Uh and it's about him sort of having a doppelganger who's Jewish in the uh, resistance uh, or Second World War Paris, uh, occupied Paris. Uh, and that had a, a brilliant opening where this uh, woman's being uh, examined uh, for racial impurities or, uh, by a doctor at the beginning. And it had sort of a, you don't know how it's connected to the rest of the film until the end. And you don't even really find out. It's quite enigmatic. Good opening. <laughs> <laughs> but not the one we're doing. <laughs> no, not the one we're doing. <laughs> let's, let's, so let's, let's tell everyone what's our opening that we are going to... What's your favourite opening for the purposes of this conversation? What's your favourite opening to any film ever? It would be the opening to Apocalypse Now, mm. Richard. Which uh, I should like to point out is not going to be nine minutes of the doors while I set everything on fire. <laughs> we're going to do... <laughs> moves from that into a, a conversation. But uh, do you like Apocalypse Now as a film in general, or is it just the beginning? Like... I love it. Absolutely love it. it, was, it again, it was one of the formative uh, experiences with cinema, because one of my teachers at boarding school insisted that we all watch it. 
uh, in his flat. <laughs> um, uh, and he kind of, he was, he kept sort of trying to tell us it would be better if we smoked weed. Um, but he couldn't actually say that sort of outright because obviously he was in loco parentis or whatever. And we were, uh, but um, yeah, so he really big, bigged up the film and uh, um, it was a sort of forbidden thing because we were officially too young to watch it so it does have a special yeah. place uh, it's sort of one of the, the first films that an adult said this is amazing and then you know i had to watch it i don't think i've ever seen it in one go all the way through i think i've only ever seen it in bits i think every time it was on channel four i watched the first hour of it and i would take I'd, then i'd like fall asleep and then i would watch the second half like i don't think i've ever watched the whole like three hours of it in one go which seems weird because i'm like i've definitely yeah. seen it now I genuinely don't know if I've seen it in one go. Apocalypse is no, pleasure. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty, it is pretty, um, it's pretty glacial, isn't it, really, in places. Um, and um, the redux, he's put in an extra 45 minutes or something. I know. I mean, come on. I mean, um, I just don't. I don't think that scene he added. Have you ever, I mean, I've never seen a film where I thought this needs to be longer. No. Uh, even short films could be shorter do you know what i mean like <laughs> i've liked bits and gone i'd like to have seen more of more fighting but i've never thought the overall film should be longer <laughs> i mean it's weird yeah, it's, exactly. like, it's, an odd, it's an odd it's an odd film this it's uh you know it's one of those films that's like the making of it is as famous as the the film itself just because of all the carnage and the bedlam and the fact that they're all just going mad you know it's a film about people going mad in a jungle while they're all going mad in a jungle you know yeah. it's yeah. sort of but it's all like weird and everyone sort of drunk and on drugs and no one liked each other and they all hated each other and it just a sort of sounds like an awful thing to have been part of <laughs> like, yeah really, really awful like, it just sounds awful like uh it's one of those films though you know you think oh it's it's glacial it's boring but if you do re-watch it it's got um several outstanding scenes like oh, yeah. quite a few like that are visually like for example the playboy dancer performance in the middle of the water that seems incredible and uh and then there's a bit where the tiger jumps out at him in the in the in the jungle like yeah. incredible as well there's just there's so much brilliant stuff in it um and also just the the budget and the sort of production standard for a film that that there's that personal and sort mm. of uh, uh, sort of uh, ambiguous i guess is the word. it's it's Weird yeah. film. And you've got to try and make a film um, to... going mad. Marlon Brando just refusing to do anything that isn't yeah. isn't crazy. Just it wouldn't be the same if it had the rock in it, put it that way. Although <laughs> Well, I feel like, you know, this is one of those you go like, oh, you know, Marlon Brando turned up, hadn't read the book, refused to do this, like turned up, he'd put on like four stones so he didn't look right and you know and all this and, and would would wouldn't wouldn't learn his lines just it said what he wanted you're gonna go that just seems like that just seems like massively disrespectful i just think that's just that doesn't impress me doesn't impress me just be better be better at your job yeah he's he's yeah well let's just say it he's a dick isn't he brando <laughs> was a huge dick have you seen the early films when he couldn't even be bothered to, to like uh, learn his lines and he's really yeah. off the guy's shoulder yeah. I mean, that's just lazy, you know? I, remember, I don't think I've ever seen a film that Marlon... I've never heard a story about any film with Marlon Brando in it where everyone isn't. Marlon basically complained that Marlon Brando was a nightmare. Uh, yeah. You know, like... And I remember like, like, the, um, like, Mutiny on the Bounty with Trevor Howard, and then Trevor Howard is like, learned his lines, and then Marlon Brando refused, just improvised. And it's like, there's a, this is based on a book. Like, you've got to do the, <laughs> do the lines, like... You can't just make, you know, you can't make up Shakespeare. You've got to do the Shakespeare, like, and then, yeah, yeah. then the people were giving Trevor Howard shit because he wasn't coming in with his lines quick enough, and they were said you need to, you need to like reply to Marlon Brando. I think his life was like, I would if I had any idea when he was going to stop talking. <laughs> it was like working with Marlon Brando. <laughs> just yeah, so well, Brand, there's another, there's another. I mean the. Um... The Apocalypse Now, Hearts of Darkness, is a famous documentary, making of documentary, uh, which d details his uh, Brando being a dick. But there's also the making of the the Isle of Dr. Moreau, is it? <laughs> yeah. where, with that film we did with Kilmer. 
I really want to see that because apparently it was even yeah. worse nightmare on that. He didn't stop ever. But wasn't it? Wasn't it? Nightmare. Apparently, was it the score? The Robert De Niro score he turns up because he didn't because he didn't want to be filmed. He didn't want to be shot full body length because he was worried about his weight. He just wouldn't wear. He was like naked from the waist down so that they couldn't film him. <laughs> Never ever film. He would just drop <laughs> with his pants so that he was like, you can't film me full length because. You get hacked like like just wouldn't you know what I mean? Just that's something they just go like maybe uh, maybe you know they just sort of go there are other actors do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> there are other actors like other actors are available. We don't need you know yeah. You don't need they did to they obviously did he obviously could sell a picture couldn't he you know yeah right yeah, yeah. but this is and also this, so we, this is a, this is a weird thing also this is a, again this is another thing where like. This scene we're going to do is basically, you go, oh, it's really incredible. Like the acting that Martin Sheen portrays, it's not acting. He's like, he's having a nervous breakdown, he's having like an alcoholic nervous breakdown. Like, this is not funny. Like, this is not, this is not brave acting. This is like, this is what people, this is like, this is, this is why things like The Joker get Oscars because people think that that's bravery in acting where it's not. It's just like, just, just. Give this man some help. He's like he's off his face. He's, he's like going to nearly die of Filming this improv scene yeah. in the window, punches a mirror. It's like it's not. I love yeah. it. I love it. <laughs> it's great though, because the whole film is about Vietnam. The whole film is about Vietnam, which is sort of like America looking in the mirror of itself. You know, so it's it's. It was improvised, I think, at the time, wasn't it? He, yeah. He, 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 yeah, but it fits with the themes of the film so brilliantly. It's one of those sort of happy accident things, you know. It, it, it's uh, there's lots of that in that film, sort of uh, themes that are almost that are subtly infused in it. Um, I've got Ooh. got props here. That you can see there's this effects um, for this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when do you want you you're going to play the soldier? I'll play the soldier. Let you be Willard. Okay. We present the opening, the opening to Apocalypse Now. Hang on, I'm just getting the helicopters. <laughs> Sorry about the accent. Saigon. Shit. I'm still only in Saigon. Everything I'm gonna wake up back in the jungle. <laughs> when I was home after my first tour, it was worse. I'd wake up and there'd be nothing. I hardly said a word to my wife until I said yes to a divorce. When I was here, I wanted to be there. When I was there, all I could think of was getting back into the jungle. I've been here a week now, waiting for a mission, getting softer. Every minute I stay in this room, I get weaker. <laughs> Every minute Charlie squats in the bush, he gets stronger. Each time I look around, the wall's moving a little tighter. Everyone gets what he wants. I wanted a mission, and for my sins, they gave me one. Brought it up to me like room service. Captain Willard, are you in there? Yeah. It was a real <laughs> choice mission, and when it was over, I'd never want another. What'd you want? Uh, you all right, Captain? How does it look like? Uh, Captain Willard of 505 Battalion, 173rd Airborne, assigned SOG. Hey, buddy, you gonna shut the door? We have orders to escort you to the airfield. What are the charges? Sir? What I did? There's no charges, Captain. You have orders to report to ComSec Intelligence in Na Trang. Na Trang? That's right. Come on, Captain. You still have a few hours to get cleaned up. Captain? Dave, uh, come on, Captain. Let's take a shower. We're going to take a shower. Uh, Here we go. Uh, uh, uh. I thank you. Dean! <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. I mean, if you've not, seen, if you've not seen Apocalypse Now, that's exactly what it's like. <laughs> uh, Harrison Ford in an early role in Apocalypse Now as well. That's a great scene, the one just after that, when he, he goes to the meeting and actually giving the, um, give him the uh, uh, mission. Yeah, yeah. So moving on, moving on. So let's move on to your miscellaneous scene. What is your favourite? Where's other scenes? Other scenes you like before you know that you didn't choose. What other scenes you have that you didn't choose that you're a big fan of? Well, you know, I wanted to do the ending from uh, uh, the thing, obviously. Yeah. I, I, I love the endings. I really love endings where everyone dies, or the, <laughs> or uh, the the main character dies. You know. Uh, I, I'm, no spoilers. Also, I thought about, <laughs> I thought about Tarantino. I just kept I thought about what I'd like to read rather than what my favourite is because uh, you know I find it very difficult to identify what my favourite is. It depends what mood you're in. Do you know what I mean? And it'd be silly. It's like what Donald Trump does if he just says the last thing he saw and that's his new favourite. You know what I mean? I don't want to do that either. <laughs> You know? So what scene have you chosen as your favourite scene? Your favourite right. miscellaneous... It is from one of my... I got, keep, Keeping with a sort of light tone, it's a scene from The Shining. <laughs> um, <laughs> Another film... The job interview from The Shining. <laughs> yeah. No, he was uh, abusive, wasn't he? I've gone... I've it's got, not, it's, this, it's weird, the theme anything. I've gone with is all... Yeah, Richard Sandling's most harrowing making of stories. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good. I mean, I love The Shining. I love The Shining, but you know, you yeah, watch it. Just seems like the worst thing to have made, like to be part of. Just awful. Apparently, he was quite nice to the kid though, because he didn't want the kid to know it was a horror movie, and was like really nice to him, and like sort of kept him sort of away from all the stress and all the misery. But also like. Kubrick, like, it's like 100 takes and shit like that, wasn't it? Like, just take after take after take. And it's just, yes. like, there's no need for that. You know what I mean? It's not, because, it, like, if they did it... Well... If, but when you watch The Shining, is every take in the film the 100th take? Uh, from, yeah, basically, from, yeah. Yeah, is it? Is it just keep going until he goes, that's it, that'll do? There's just no need for it. Just no need for it. <laughs> you know? Well, I... Uh, you know, good. for me, good. he's to me he's on another level of good. Mm. You know, he's on the level of good that you only get if you do a hundred takes of every shot, basically. You know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think a lot of the actors were in his films. They just thought, "Fuck this! I'm in a Kubrick film. I'll do I'll do a thousand fucking yeah. takes." You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I bet you know. There's not. I mean, yeah. It took. Did it take, they did. They did the uh, blood elevator scene in in three takes. Well, there's no people in it, is there? So, well, well. apparently it took. Um, <laughs> well, I think it took like nine weeks to set it. like to to, to reset it or something. So yeah. it was like yeah, three yeah. takes, but it took <laughs> nearly like, five months to film it. So <laughs> so he made up for it in time what he lost in <laughs> amount of takes. Yeah, hundreds of takes, like. I think Shelley Duval said that um, she had to carry bottles of water with her because she the continued takes and the fact that she's in a constant state of distress meant that she just couldn't didn't have enough crying in her, so she had to have bottles of the water on hand to like throw in her face to look like she was crying the whole time. Oh, but that's horrific. Yeah, oh, really. <laughs> just bad. I did like the story that they uh, Jack Nicholson apparently used to be a, a reserve fireman. And so uh, the made, other thing they made a bowser door for him and he smashed through it because he's used to smashing down doors because he used to be a, used to be a fireman. <laughs> so they had to make a tougher door for him to smash through. Ah. Ah. Yeah, there's it, but none of the actors in the Kubrick films seem to go on and uh, have like a huge career of their own, apart from Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. But well, earlier were, on. He does a lot of people, but then like, yeah, but I think, but he was very, he's one of those great, he's one of those things, he's one of those people who I like that he fully utilised like the Elstree people or like, you know, they made all those movies, it's like people like Philip Stone who's in this, you know, he was like, they would always have those weird 
sort of British actors that just really clicked with them. And I think like Spielberg would use them, that they would yeah. just be really yeah, like, yeah. like Fritz only plays like the mum and dad, he plays the dad in um, in the Clockwork Orange, who's like the like yeah. Brady, Brady, the the caretaker and, you know, he's also, I forget, I think, forget which Indiana Jones film he's in, but he's like the British console. Like he just yeah. has these things where he's like, oh, it's him. Then of course we'll get him in it because it's Pinewood and we'll just get that, you know. So he's got yeah, really, yeah. Good, like, really good at getting a, an ensemble, like, a supporting cast in. But yeah. So, Brilliant. yeah. But yeah. So I do, I mean, I do like The Shining. The Shining is a great film. And also, it is weird that it's, it works. I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion, I don't know about you, but I think it works because it's not like the book. I think the absolutely fact that it's not like the book is why it's good. Absolutely, come on! I mean, let's be honest. Stephen King is a, is a hack. You know what I mean? And I think <laughs> I've got this theory about films, especially the films of the seventies. All of really great ones are made are, are from shitty books, like The Godfather, shitty book, right? I mean, it's okay. Uh, Jaws, that's a shit book. I don't know if you've read that. That's terrible. You know. And this as well. I'd say this goes falls into that pattern as well. It's, you know, yeah. definitely better. Um, I just read um, a lot of movies are a lot better than, than the books they're based on. I, I just tried to read um, The Ipcrest File by uh, Len Dayton. Yeah. Um, it's terrible compared to the movie. The movie <laughs> is, is much, much better, honestly. Yeah. Just in terms of char characterization, things they flesh out, you know, the way they rearrange the plot, much better. So yeah, yeah. but it's also not, you, it's not controversial to me to say the, it's better than the book and he improved it. You know, yeah, not at it, all. It is, it is a really good thing, and also just some of the cinematography in it is phenomenal. Just the sort of, especially you know, it's very famous, but the Steadicam stuff is amazing, like genuinely yes. like, incredible stuff. And apparently the guy who did it signed on for six months, and then. Uh, as it wouldn't overrun. Then it overrun, and he was supposed to be in Rocky 2. So he had to do a week on The Shining, then a week on Rocky 2, and he had to fly <laughs> every Sunday. He had to, like, commute back and forth to, like, America. That must have done his head in. It must have been great to go from Kubrick to, like, Stallone. <laughs> that must have been quite jarring, you know. But, yeah, yeah, it was amazing. So this is the scene we're going to do. Uh, is So it's actually not one of probably the most... probably not one of the... Uh, most iconic scenes from The Shining, technically speaking, right. is it? So, would you like to explain what the uh, what the film is, what the scene is? Yes, it's this interview scene. It's actually the sort of second or third scene in the film. Um, hmm. I think it might be the Jack. Yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah. Um, and it it Jack is it's his interview, but it's not it's it's ostensibly an interview, but he's already got the job basically, because they don't have anyone else for it. So it's just sort of the job being explained to him by the, um, the hotel manager. Uh, and it's amazing because it basically sets out exactly what's going to happen in the film. Yeah, he know um, them, they know it. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, exactly. But, but Kubrick does it in a way that is masterful and Nolan just does it in a way where it just feels like an exposition dump. You know what I mean? I, yeah, I just think, yeah. you know, it's my personal opinion. I can, yeah. um, so, you, so it's almost, it's so brilliantly written and constructed that it's almost holographic of the whole film, right? All of, every little bit of this film and little bits of dialogue contain a picture of the whole, which is another thing Kubrick did, which is what I mean about him working on a whole sort of other level. Nolan can't, can't. Nolan wishes he could do anything like that, you know. <laughs> really. Um, so, would, do you want to give it a go? I haven't, I haven't read it out loud, and this copy has stage directions kind of mixed in, but I think we can get in. Just ignore those and move on. My accent's going to be really shit on this one as well. Sorry, America. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you don't, you don't know. What, you, know, you might be casting directors watching this, Eli. This is for the, you know. I know. I can't help it though. I <laughs> there's nothing. Nothing can be done <laughs> about my accents. They're famously awful. "Quote <laughs> unquote American accent." Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll be doing. Where exactly in America are you? Are you aiming for, Eli, with this accent? Let's uh, let's try and pin it down to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please don't. <laughs> it's gen general American. 
Nice. So which I'm character? You gonna, to, which character? You I'll gonna do. Be? I'm going to be Jack, and you you're going to do Olman, are you? I assume you'd want to be Jack Nicholson. <laughs> yes. One one doesn't like to presume, but I'm assuming when there's a choice of being Jack Nicholson or someone else, you'd choose to be Jack Nicholson. Uh, Jack Nicholson is my absolute favourite actor of all time. Yeah. Film actor of all time. So. Well, he's great. Yeah. Well, Jack Nicholson's great because obviously we know Jack Nicholson has been quite a big sort of blah, 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 blah. But he has come from like proper actor and proper indie actor and proper like, you know, writer and, you know, like sort of yes. like, stuff for the monkeys and stuff like that. But like proper, like creative tour de force as well as that. And I think, yes. I think it was only Batman where he really made proper money because he got like a sort of Alec Guinness Star Wars type deal to be in it. Yeah, yeah. But up to then, he was only really earning... Well, I'm not saying bad money, but he wasn't like he wasn't Harrison Ford money for most of his He was still just kind of the actor Jack Nicholson, and it was yeah. that that yeah. makes him the Jack Nicholson we know. Even though we love, you know, this was not a well, you know, I don't think you do something like The Shining for the for like for the millions and millions of pounds you're going to get out out of it. No. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely not. He's he had a lot of integrity, you know, his whole career. I think. Basically. Yeah. So let's try. So I'll start with the interview. We're so having an interview. He's just turned up. <clears throat> He's just showing him around, having the chat in the office. He's seen the Overlook Hotel. Here we are. Uh, when the place was built in 1907, there was very little interest in winter sports, and this site was chosen for its seclusion and scenic beauty. Well, it certainly got plenty of that. <laughs> well, winters can be fantastically cruel. Uh, and the basic idea is to cope with the very costly damage and depreciation that can occur. And this consists mainly of running the boiler, heating different parts of the hotel on a daily rotating basis, repair damage as it occurs, and doing repairs so the elements can get a foothold. Well, that sounds fine to me. Physically, it's not a very demanding job. The only thing that can get a bit trying up here during the winter is uh, a tremendous sense of isolation. Well, that just happens to be exactly what I'm looking for. I'm outlining a new writing project, and uh, five months of peace is just what I want. That's very good, Jack, because uh, for some people, solitude and isolation can, uh, of itself, become a problem. Not for me. How about your wife and son? How do you think they'll take to it? They'll love it. I don't suppose they... Uh, told you anything in Denver about the tragedy we have had up here during the winter of 1970? I don't believe they did. Well, uh, my predecessor in this job hired a man named Charles Grady as the winter caretaker, and he came up here with his wife and two little girls, I think about eight and ten, and he had a good employment record, good references, and for what I've been told, I, I mean, he seemed like a completely normal individual. But at some point during the winter, he must have suffered a kind of complete mental breakdown. He ran amok and uh, killed his family with an axe, stacked him neatly in one of the rooms of the West Wing. And uh, then he uh, he uh, put put both barrels of the shotgun in, in his mouth. Police, uh, uh, they thought it was what the old timers used to call cabin fever, kind of claustrophobic reaction to what can occur when people are shut in together over long periods of time. Well, that is uh, quite a story. Yeah, it is. Oh, it's still hard for me to believe it actually happened here, but it did. And uh, I think you can appreciate why I wanted to tell you about it. I certainly can. And uh, I also understand why your people in Denver left it for you to tell me. Well, obviously, some people can be put off by the idea of staying alone in a place where something like that actually happened. Well, you can rest assured, Mr. Ullman, that's not going to happen with me. And uh, as far as my wife is concerned, I'm sure she'll be absolutely fascinated when I tell her about it. She's a confirmed ghost story and horror film addict. <laughs> Scene! Yay! There we go. There we go. I mean, I'd give you the job. I'd give you the job. Thank you. Based sold on that, definitely give you the job. <laughs> Again, you can see you can see the self-reference in that last line, you know, and it, it's subtly done. It, it makes you it, it makes you think about ghost stories and horror films, yeah. you know, and so you're already setting up an expectation about what's happening. It's just brilliant. It's it's brilliant dialogue, I think. 
I'm um, glad to see that you're coping with the uh, lockdown well by choosing the opening scene. <laughs> it's now about a man, a, dr a drug addled alcoholic, hallucinating in his, in his on his own in a room, and then The Shining about a man who, through enforced isolation, goes mad and murders everybody with an axe. <laughs> well, you know what? You know what, Richard? I, if you choose a funny scene to sort of play. To, it, it shows up how shit you're doing it even worse, doesn't it? I think <laughs> that's what I figured. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, the thank you. I wanted to do the nights that say near, you know, but <laughs> I think that, that, would, that would fail. You got man or shrubbery? Yeah, all right, all right. I mean, it's not, I mean, you've, literally, you've literally got a shrubbery behind you. It's like, it's like, you mean, you know, really. I've got two shrubberies. But look at the, the scale difference on those shrubberies, man. Maybe it's like maybe it's like Lord of the Rings, like a sort of false perspective. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. You know, the act, Matt Box. Um, yeah. He, he said that he didn't go for the the double for uh, Harry Potter. Um, I remember when they were they were auditioning for the Hobbit. Uh, no, it was Lord of the Rings. Basically, I had at least three people call me up and go, they're looking for hobbits. Eli, they're looking for hobbits. <laughs> <laughs> got to go. Get down there. They're <laughs> hobbits. Hobbits, Eli. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> it's that thing where it's like, just people go, they mean, and also it's like, they probably meant, probably meant well. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. But you're like, thanks guys. You know, <laughs> also it's like, when people tell you that stuff as if like it's never or also like even if you'd have wanted to like it's like it's as simple as that it's like when i used to obviously if you've only ever seen me on this you've only ever seen me short hair but normally i have massive hair and for like eight years all i ever get people going like oh, why aren't you in game of thrones like it was up to <laughs> I'm, just, well, I'm not in the mood i don't really fancy it <laughs> that's how work that's how yeah. active you know I, sort of, I fancy that and then i do it yeah Man, you know, they're doing hobbits. You're like, you know what you should do? You should do you should do that thing that no one will cast you for because you're not on the, the level of fame that would get you seen. Yes. Like, yes, but you know, but you know as well as I do that people that how exploitative a lot of these film companies are, because they'll try and get some buzz for the film by saying it's an open audition, you know. Yeah. And and then they did it with the piano as well. Like anyone could have auditioned for that role in the piano. Not anyone yeah. would have got it, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But it gets a buzz for the film, which is cruel. It's cruel. People are yeah. cruel to actors, really. Yeah, yeah. I know. I remember. I mean, I've done it. I've gone for cast. I've been to casting sometimes where I've been in castings with some quite famous people. Do you know? Like I was in one casting. I was in a casting once, uh, and like, I think like, well. Nick Frost was just leaving, <laughs> and I think James Corden was about to come in. You know, right. and you're, and you're like, there's a lot of people going to have to be busy for me to get anywhere near this. <laughs> <laughs> this is not like you go. Oh, it's really nice to be seen in the same company. It, it is, it is. But at the same time, there's a lot of people going to have to be busy for this to ever become a legitimate thing. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's nice that they saw you. It is, it is, but I, I didn't, leave, <laughs> yeah. didn't leave with any sort of spring in my step that there was any chance of that happening. No. <laughs> so anyway, moving on to your last scene, Mr. Mister. So, you okay. know, what have you chosen for your final scene? Uh, I've got the last scene of The Italian Job, the original version. Yeah. Um, Which I think we can all agree is is the perfect film to recreate on Zoom in isolation. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of themes, you know, Brexit, remember that, and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. So <laughs> I thought it was. Uh, it's at least it's comic. Yeah, slightly. I mean, so little thing, um, little thing to infuriate you, uh, Eli. If you type in the Italian job into IMDb, the uh, this is the second one that comes up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the first one that comes, I mean, obviously it does have Jason Statham in it, but you know that's so it gets a pass. But it's obviously not. I've never, I've never seen it. Is it 
Is it good Statham? It's not top Statham, is it? I mean, not, no, it, it, it's 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 supporting it's supporting actor Statham. It's ensemble Statham, yeah. which is fine. I'm not against. I'm not against Statham on principle. You know, I, yeah. I can uh, like I can I like uh, I quite liked um, that film. It was a uh, with Jennifer Lopez. He did uh, that was a uh, crime. Yeah, Parker. Parker. Yeah, yeah. I love the books. I love those books. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's about books. Good, it's yeah. good. Like the very few, like you know, the Richard Stark novels don't get a good, don't get good no. treatment, unfortunately. But they don't. They don't. No. So you it's know. a shame. I mean, actually, well, it's, it's not true. I mean, but I mean, generally, there of course is you know, there's like two good adaptations, but wasn't allowed to use the name Parker, which is why you don't know that it's a film of the Parker novels. Well, he wasn't no, but then you know, funnily enough, when he he came back um, and he he wrote the screenplay for the Grifters, yeah, yeah, um, and the director, uh, Frears, Stephen Frears, is that right? He directed the Grifters. Yeah, yeah. Um, he insisted uh, that the credit should go to Richard Stark rather than Donald Westlake. Yeah. So, so weird because that's. That's Jim. That's a Jim Thompson. Is that is that the one that's a Jim Thompson novel that's adapted yeah, by Donald Westlake? Right. Like you got all this weird. That's right. You got this weird. Yeah. You know, like why not just get Jim Thompson to adapt it or ask Donald Westlake? Because he was dead. Because he was dead. I know, but like very, very it's, dead. Like, it's just a really yeah. weird sort of uh, sort of. You look at you go. Oh, this is interesting, and then it is good. But yeah, yeah. yeah. The Hot Rock is one of my favourite Donald Westlake uh, book adaptations. The Hot Rock. Yeah, it's a Robert. I hadn't heard of that. Robert Redford, sort of heist movie, George Segal. Uh, okay. It's, but it's Westlake, so it, it's, it's not Dortmund. Parker, though. It's not Parker, it's yeah, a Dortmund. Dortmund. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, talk, Richard, amongst, I could, talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I, could literally, I could literally talk to you about Richard Stark for another hour and a half, but I don't really should. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to find... Uh, the script for the Italian job. Um, are you still there? We've lost Richard for a bit. Ooh, oh, frozen. Uh, now, there is uh, apparently an alternative ending <laughs> to the Italian job. Perhaps we could discuss that while we uh, wait for Richard, uh, the host, to return. Go ahead. Uh, well, now that Richard's out of the way, it's my show. <laughs> go for it mate let's hear from the front row all right well your american accent sounds like west virginia so you Thank can tell you. people you have a west virginian accent okay um <laughs> a convincing west virginian know, or just barely like it no just barely like it, it took me a good it took me a good while to be like like i i could tell i was like okay so your british accent's gone but what does this sound like and I almost went like, like British uh, Canadian. And I was right, like, no, yeah. that's it's it's too raspy. I was like, yeah, it's West Virginia. That sounds about right. Uh, any update on Richard returning? <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, he's still got that same grin. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll message him and see how he's how he's going. Um, okay, but how I've got this uh, this set up. So that I've got a little truck here. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right off the turntable. Amazing. So oh. that you can imagine that's the truck going along at the beginning of this scene. Oh, here I we go. I don't comes. know if it ha here we go. He's back. Yay! Yay! Okay. What's going on? What happens? <laughs> Where'd you all go? Where'd well, you... um, Don very kindly let us know that the accent that Eli has is West Virginia. So we, West Virginia. We've learned something oh, today, oh. Um, and now, um, and now Don's going to go and sit back on the on the sofa. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm so sorry. I have no idea what happened there. That was like a sort of, uh, well, I don't know. That just like, so you no you idea. froze, Eli. You froze, yeah. and then I carried on assuming that the problem was you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was you, mate. Yes, yeah, it was fine. Out. It's not you, it's me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very disappointed you didn't come back as Richard the White. Instead of I know. <laughs> I, was like, 
I should, I know, this is like, I feel like I should have rebooted myself, but I didn't. Like. Got to have the full uh, gray beard. <laughs> it's good. I just, I just basically went for the sort of Last Temptation of Christ ending, where it just suddenly just, <laughs> just finishes that's, and it rubs off. Doesn't he so, die at the end of that? He dies at the end of that as well, doesn't he? Spoiler alert. Yes. <laughs> so, I'm just looking, the Italian I'm job, just, Eli. <laughs> yes, I'm just checking the sound effects record to see if there's um, any car crashes or anything. We could add some uh, verisimilitude to this. Uh, I've got a horse, <laughs> one, horse whinnies, cricket background. That won't do, will it? Um, air, a jet airliner. No, sorry. We just have to imagine. A, just have to, have to use our imagination like suckers. I've, I've got, also got this. I don't know if you can see that. Richard is uh, perfect. Little truck going around there. I'm back. I can see it. It's my back. Um, yeah, it took them ages to film the end. The end scene. It took them ages to film that uh, because the road it was on led to a restaurant. And when they filmed on the Saturday, no one went there. But it was really busy on a Sunday. So when they got there, they couldn't like people wouldn't wouldn't stay behind the corners. It was like, no, I've got to go there for my Sunday dinner. And so they basically yeah. broke through the barricades and like trashed it. And then then it rained <laughs> and then it started snowing and it took them like two weeks to do it. By the end of it, they were filming. They had to like clear snow off the track to like film it. It was just like crazy madness. But yeah, I'd like about like the Italian jobs. It's one of those films that everyone says is good. And you go, I, you know, you watch it and you go, actually it is, it is, you know, it is, it's that yeah. right blend of good, but also really fun. Like it works in that way where it's it takes itself not it doesn't take itself seriously, but it's not stupid. It's just really great. Yes. Like uh, it's yeah. a balance. Yeah, it's a balance. Uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's also the ending was stolen, wasn't it? Basically by uh, Guy Ritchie for um, yeah. Is it which it's uh, Lock, Stock and Two Smoky Barrels, Lock, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, which has Jason Statham in it. it does it does. <laughs> Correct. Is that Top Statham? That's Top That's got well, to be Top again, Statham. Well, again, it's Ensemble Statham. He's not really a name yet. He, you know, he was like, oh, wow. essentially his first film. So, you know, he's just one of the four. So, yeah. you know, so it's good. And this is like, yeah, like it was, a, a, they didn't have permission to shut the streets off when they did the stuff in Turin. So uh, they just did it. And they, so the traffic jams are real, apparently. Yeah. And the people Everyone being angry is really angry. Yeah. Yeah, and people sort of jumping out of the way, afraid yeah. for their life. Sort of, yeah. yeah. Nice. So yeah, so it was obviously it's one of those things where it's supposed to be. I think there was there were it wasn't supposed to necessarily end like this originally, but you can't have this was still in the era when the good like the baddies couldn't get away with it or seem to be get away with it. Right. So, that's why they changed it because I when I was trying to find the script. A lot of uh, search results come up for like the the original I intended ending, mm. which uh, what has does it have them getting back home and yeah, they get some, it gets it ends with a, a picture of them living the high life, we're, we're enjoying yeah. the money. I think yeah. Mm. yeah, and I think the idea was that it the, that is, they also set up for a sequel, which is like you know the gold goes over the mafia collecting, they got to go and steal it back from the mafia. Like right. I think it's like the idea. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And as I said, I don't know if you heard before I went off, but like Michael Caine couldn't drive when he made this film, so he never drives in this film. He's always a passenger. Wow. So you'd like Wow. Like how the dude never bowls, Michael Caine never drives yeah. in this film because he couldn't drive at the time. It, he gets in that, the driver's that, seat that, and then he gets out of the driver's seat in like two shots, but he never drives. He's always a passenger. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. oh, that's excellent. Well, it's higher status to be a passenger, isn't it? it gives you, yeah. it gives you a high, higher but status. Not, but, not, but not in the back seat. <laughs> no. <laughs> if you, if you, can, you can claim front seat status, then yes. Well, that makes that's me feel right. good about the fact that I've never learned to drive as well, then. Yeah. 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 Which is weird because you, you are at castings, you get the thing where it says, um, Clean driving license, you clean UK driving license, yes or no? And if I tick no, because I haven't got one, it looks like I've got a dirty driving <laughs> license, doesn't it? I know. But if if I, tick yes, then I, I feel like I, I feel like if anyone would have a dirty driver's license, it'd be you, Eli. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 
So we're going to attempt, right. Matt, well, Matt, Mr. Matt Box, <laughs> to uh, we're going to attempt to be the crew. Uh, so the, the van's just crashed over the, like, high over the edge. Lovely bit of music playing, everyone's singing, and we're all trying to creep forwards to the to the goal. Uh, I'd just like to apologise for this English accent. <laughs> <laughs> Hold still. Hold still. <laughs> Nobody move. We're balancing right on the edge. Very slowly move this way. Very slowly. Don't make a sharp movement. Come as far up this end as you can get. Watch it. Watch it. Watch it, Bill! <laughs> the gold is pulling it over the edge. We'll have to get it back. Get back! Get back! <laughs> now hold still. Don't move. Don't move at all. Don't no one get out the door. Neither. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll all go. Edge back as far as you can go. Go to, to, cat, to counterbalance me. Now. <laughs> Hang on a minute, lads. I've got a great idea. Uh, Scene! Hey. Yes, excellent work, excellent work. Well played, well done, well done. If you've not seen the Italian job, that's exactly how it ends. <laughs> Love that's it. Exactly what it was like. Oh, yes. fantastic work, fantastic work, Eli. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause with Eli Silverman. Thanks, everybody. Where can we find you online, Mr. Silverman? Where, where are you? Who are you? What's going on? How can they find you? Where you can find me uh, on Twitter, it's Eli Snoid, which is spelt E L I S N O I D. Um, I've got I've got a podcast, Richard. Do you know about that? Uh, no, tell me about your podcast, Eli. I've got a podcast, um, Cheap Show, and that's available uh, at uh, all podcast places. You can get uh, and uh, just put Cheap Show in. And ignore the uh, the band in America that's called Cheap Show because uh, we're bigger than that. And um, <laughs> uh, we haven't done many movies on Cheap Show, but we did watch. Uh, we subjected ourselves to uh, the Keith Lemon the movie uh, oh, and did a sort yeah. of com commentary. <laughs> blimey, blimey! He should apologise for that. Let alone blackface. <laughs> he should apologise for that film. Do you know what I mean? Um, uh, yeah, what else? Yeah, um, I did a short film a few years ago. People uh, might be interested in watching on Vimeo, Clanker Man, uh, which is uh, a little short film. If you're into, uh, it's a bit of a sort of surreal comedy sort of thing. So that's that's where I'm at, Richard. Good, good. Before we go, is there anything pressing that needs to be addressed on Facebook before I leave? Before we leave us too. Our Saturday night of joy. Are there any um, pressing points? There were delighted shouts of Kitty when Matt brought his um, cat on. Cat. Yes. Well <laughs> done, Matt. Well done, Matt. Excellent work. So that's mostly just cat appreciation. Is that where we... Uh, this is a submarine. This is a submarine. If you're bored with the bus, I've got a submarine there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's wow. Just that's uh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> this is turning into theatre. <laughs> I feel like a prop comedian. It, you know, props. Props work. Props work on yeah. Zoom. Yeah. These are salad tongs. These are like yeah. sci-fi salad tongs. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I mean, if anything, I mean, if I like like the way you've tried to set this up for a sequel. Where now we're gonna have to come back and work out what the salad song has got to do with anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, <laughs> perfect. It's a perfect, perfect mix. Well, thank you very much for coming. If you have enjoyed this, uh, check out our acts. Uh, support them if you can. If you can support us, uh, I think you can see at the bottom of the screen. Kofi.com, Richard Sandling, buy me a kebab. Uh, I need kebabs, people. I need kebabs. When they when the mm. lockdown's over, I'm going to need to eat all the kebabs I can to keep my strength <laughs> up. Uh, I need some, uh, you know, I need need to, I need two meters worth of kebabs so I can always know how far away I am supposed to be from everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Six meters worth of kebabs, please. That's what I'm going for. Uh, if you've enjoyed, everyone. Uh, tune in next week. If you want to be in the front row, you can be in the front row so you can be part of the uh, live experience. Feel free to check out that information. Join uh, Don and Phil and everyone else and have a lovely time. I'll talk to you in person. You'll be part of the video and hang around afterwards in the green room. The green room, imagine such a thing. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, it's been a joy to see you. Same time next week, 9 p.m. Saturday, UK time. Richard Sanning's Perfect Movie will be back with more excellent guests and more excellent audience like you. Thank you so much for watching on Facebook and you're commenting. Thank you so much for watching wherever else you're watching it on YouTube. Uh, that's it. My name is Richard Sanding. Uh, a round of applause for the acts you saw. You saw Matt Box and you saw Eli Stilwell. I'm Woo! Richard Sanding. Thank you very much. Good night. Woo! Woo!